January 17th was Quitter's Day. It was just a few days ago. Anybody have any idea what that means? <laughs> kind of along the same line, yeah. It's a special day that you can quit even trying to do your New Year's resolution. <laughs> which, it's interesting, you made your New Year's resolution 16 days before, and uh, now you can officially quit. Some people uh, say, yeah, that's about right. Other people are like, why so long? Why did we uh, have to wait this long to do it? And I want to bring up a slide. I found this on the internet. I, I just love this. I, I appreciate the efficiency of this guy using the same sheet of paper year after year because I guess the resolutions just don't change. It started in 2011. It's, at the time he posted it, it was 2020. And uh, you see some of the things you usually see, you know, lose weight. Very simple, straight to the point the first time. Then probably didn't go so well. Maybe, in fact, gained some. So depend on the color coding, you see that it maybe was lose more weight in 2012 because it's written in red, same year as uh, the year, same color as the year that's there. That didn't go so well, so then, you know, in purple, 2013, maybe you lost some, but gained it back, so lose weight again and uh, get fit, or next year, uh, at the end of the year, he writes in. I love the last ones there, you know, first time, just give up alcohol. Give up cigarettes. Well, that's not happening. So then it becomes a, well, drink less or something here. And so we go through these New Year resolutions here. And as Christians, we sometimes put down resolutions as well. Uh, we want to improve our walk with the Lord. We want to get more serious about our faith. We want to grow in our faith and Yet, oftentimes, as we put down resolutions to grow spiritually, they're just like any other resolution. We're aware how short we fell the year before. We have this earnest desire to do better, but it's met with the harsh reality of disappointments, setbacks, and then sometimes feelings of failure and even hopelessness. And if Satan can get a Christian into such a spiral, because it is a literal spiritual death spiral, then he has that Christian exactly where he wants them to be, living a defeated Christian life, a life that's filled with perpetual hopes but constant and dashed disappointment. But that's the very opposite of the life that the Lord said that he wants for each and every Christian. And it's certainly a far cry from the abundant life that Christ promised was available to all Christians. So as we start a new year here, I want to begin by looking at the recovery of a Christian from one of the most colossal failures ever recorded in Scripture. It occurs after Christ has risen from the dead, and he appears on the shore of the lake where his disciples have been out trying to catch fish, and he helps them once again with a catch of fish, a miraculous uh, catch of fish. And when they come ashore, he's already cooked breakfast for him. He's got some fish and bread cooking over a fire to eat breakfast with him. And look at John 21. Marty made reference to this last week, and there's essentially, I told him last Sunday in the uh, foyer that essentially I'm going to be talking a little bit about that passage and some other ones, so it must be a God thing because he's going to pick up on the psalm that he didn't complete as he comes back. So it's kind of funny sometimes how that sort of overlaps. But in John 21, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than he, these? And the Greek word that he uses there for love is agape. And I want to put a pin in my sermon for a second, okay? I'm going to go off on a tangent for a moment. Marty and I are fortunate that we were able to go to a great seminary. We were able to learn how to read the scriptures in their original languages. We're able to then use that knowledge and that skill that we gain to break the eternal word of life as pastors using our spiritual gifts. But I would never want you to think that because you don't read Greek or Hebrew that somehow you're missing out on something, that there's some secret knowledge that Marty and I get that you know, we kind of dispense out to you all up here that's not true. You have great scholars that 
took years and lifetimes of study to translate the scripture so that you can know that God is speaking directly to you when you read the scriptures. And sometimes you have to read a couple of versions to try to understand a verse a little better or something. And then in a passage like this, then he gives you pastors and teachers to help explain another thing. But I, I'd be remiss if I somehow let you think somehow or another that just because you don't read it in the original language that you're missing out on God's communication to you. Nothing could be further from the truth. I want you to have complete trust in the scriptures that he gave you, that he protected and handed down through the centuries so that you have it, so that the very voice of God is speaking to you when you read those scriptures. Okay, coming back from the tangent into the uh, sermon here now. He asked him, Simon, son of God, do you love, and he uses the word love there, for agape, more than these. And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but he changes the word for love there in the Greek to a brotherly love, agape being a unconditional love, a supreme form of love, phileo being more like a brotherly love, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so he says, Lord, I love you, but he changes the word. And Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. And then Christ said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he uses that same word again, agape. And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he uses the same word again, phileo. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And then Christ said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo? me. He uses the word that Peter has been using. And Peter was hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love phileo you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now, a lot of people will read that passage. They don't think that Jesus is getting in some well-deserved sort of digs on Peter. He asked him three times, just like Peter denied him. Three times, he asked him if he loves him, you know, unconditionally, supremely. Peter, maybe in a moment of brutal honesty, is saying, no, I, I'm the one that betrayed you. No, I don't. I don't think that's what's going on here. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. I think Christ is doing a beautiful thing here, and he's doing it to a follower who has failed him. It shows his heart for us, and it shows his priority for us. He has a wonderful way of restoring us when we do fail him. He doesn't humiliate us. I don't think that's what he's doing to Peter here. He doesn't criticize us and certainly doesn't ask us to make a resolution, whether New Year's or any time during the year, to try harder. Pull yourself up by the spiritual bootstraps. Do a little better. Instead, he takes us aside and he asks us to simply reaffirm our love for him. Peter had failed him miserably when he fled with the other disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then later, he publicly denied him three times. So Peter had to have these doubts. Of, was he really a Christ follower? Could he really even call himself a disciple when he'd been so unfaithful to Jesus during his most critical and crucial hour? But I think that Christ is being gentle with him here, and he's given him a if you will, a glimpse into the future. Pentecost is coming, and Peter, you're about to have such a leadership role in this new entity called the church. I want you to tend my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. He's establishing him for what he's doing. I don't think he's humiliating Peter at all. And as you begin a new year, you may be painfully aware of how you failed the Lord in many ways. Maybe you weren't faithful. Maybe you disobeyed his word time and time again. Maybe you denied him by the way that you live your life. Just like Peter, Jesus wants to take you aside. He doesn't want to berate you. He doesn't want to humiliate you. He does want to have you examine your love for him. He asked Peter three times, do you love me? Peter's answer was yes. And then he reaffirmed his will for Peter. This is what I want you to do. He's willing to take you aside no matter how much you may think that you failed him and failed him and failed him again and ask you the same question. Do you love me? 
And then he'll plainly tell you what he wants you to do. Now, I'm not going to soft sell it. He has said in John 14 that if you love me, then you'll obey me. Obedience is wrapped up in love for Christ. I love a point that Marty made last week in a sermon, and I told him this too. It's like, hey, I was going to make the same point. Interesting. So now you'll get a double tap on the thing. It really must be a God thing uh, here sometimes, the way it works. Uh, But when you slow down, when you really think about it, when you meditate for a moment, you'll realize that God needs nothing from you or from me. You, nor I, can do anything to help or improve God's existence. Nothing. He's all-sufficient. He's all-powerful. He's all-wise. He has always existed. But since he is love, according to 1 John 4, he does choose to love and to seek a relationship with us. And so as we review how we related to God the last year or the last few years in obedience to his commands, we could very easily feel like we have come up short, may feel like we failed badly. But here's what I want to have you think about today with me for a few minutes. I want you to consider how Jesus relates to people who are contrite, who are humble, who are very much aware of their failings and their shortcomings compared to how he relates to people who are proud, who are self-reliant. I'm going to read a passage here. It's familiar to a lot of you. It's from Luke 7. I'm not going to put all the words up here because I want you to just listen to the story as it happened in Christ's life. I want you to let those words just wash over you for a moment. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting to eat with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. She was an immoral woman. And when she learned that he was reclining at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with the hair of her head, and she began kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, he said to himself, get that, didn't say it out loud. If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is, who is touching him, that she's a sinner. And then Jesus responded, even though the Pharisee thought it to himself, Jesus responded and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. He said, a money lender had two debtors. The one owed him 500 denarii. Denarii is about a day's wages. So he owes him for 500 days worth of work. Sizable amount of money. And the other debtor, 50. When they were unable to repay, he canceled the debts of both. So which of them will love him more. Simon answered and said, I assume the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you judge correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but she's not stopped kissing my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And when those who were reclining at table with Jesus, they began saying to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And Christ said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
You see the difference there in that story? The way Christ treated this humble, repentant woman and the way he treated this proud Pharisee? He really does humiliate the Pharisee. He points out his deficiencies as a host. This woman, he's kind. He's protective. He's forgiving. So it makes me wonder, when I fail him, as I so often do, how do I approach him? Trying to explain some sort of explanation, some sort of justification? Or do I come to him with words and actions of a repentant that show that I love him? A few pages later in Luke's gospel, in Luke 15, he tells three parables of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost prodigal son. And it says there in Luke 15, as the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus, they're coming, they're wanting to be with Jesus, they're wanting to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled that Jesus welcomed them. That's the operative phrase there in the thing. Jesus was actually welcoming them, and they're bothered by that. My gosh, he's telling them to come. He's acting like it's okay that they come. And the three parables that follow, to me, illustrate how God seeks out the repentance who have lost their way. Marty correctly teaches that there's no analogy that you can just stretch forever before it will break down. There's no example that will fit everything. And oftentimes these three parables are used correctly to talk about people coming to saving faith in Christ, people that are lost. But it will work here about people who also have gone the other way. It's one sheep out of the sheep fold. He's not different than the other sheep. He is a sheep, and he has a good shepherd in the story that seeks him out, leaving the other 99 to restore him. I love the paintings they have of that where the sheep has got himself in trouble. He's on a precipice of a cliff, and you see the good shepherd literally hanging onto a twig of the branch and reaching down to save the errant sheep that's gone his own way. He's the good shepherd. And what Christ teaches in that parable is that there's more rejoicing in heaven over that one errant sheep being recovered than the other 99 that he didn't have to go looking out for. Same for the coin. It's no different than the other coins in the bag. But when it's found by the woman who cleans her house diligently until she finds it, the same phrase is used. There is more rejoicing in heaven over the gain of this lost errant coin. The story of the prodigal son, the father in that story is the earthly model, if you will, of our heavenly father, who when the son treats him badly, he's been raised correctly, but he still goes his own errant way. And the father, it says, sits there and looks down that road. You get the sense that it's been an everyday thing since the son went his own wrong way. It says that the father saw him. You don't know if he saw him first or the son saw it from far away. I tend to think because he's the God figure in the story that he saw the son limping back, asking for forgiveness. And he violates all protocol of the time. He kind of pulls up his robe. And so here's this old man's legs running down the road where he finds the son. He falls on him with hugs and kisses and calling for unmerited fine clothing and a ring and demanding a celebration begin because you repented. You came back to me and to my love. There's no accusation by the father to the son that went away, no humiliation, just a reaffirmation of love between the two. When Jesus was asked, which of the commandments is the greatest? He immediately reached back into the inerrant truth, the very words of God from the ancient scriptures. And it was an immediate response. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
I had a family member not too long ago that contacted me, and he said he felt that he had so abandoned God for so long, he didn't see how he could ever be restored and be forgiven. I've been praying for him for a long time. I told him, go back to your first love. Begin to do again the things that you first did. But the answer would be the same for me. He may think that I didn't stray, that I don't fail the Lord, that I don't mess up. He'd be wrong. And the answer is the same for me as it is for him out of Revelation 2. The angel of the church of Ephesus writes, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they're apostles, but they're not and found them to be liars, and you've persevered, and you have patience, and you've labored for my name's sake, and have become weary. But you've got the horse and the cart of faith mixed up, because verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent. And do the first works of the first love, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, it occurs to me that many of you are probably exactly like me. And by that, this is what I mean. When I fail my Lord, as I do, the only one who's really surprised at my repeated stumbling and failures is me. He's not surprised. He wasn't surprised that all of the apostles would run when he was arrested. He told them they would. He told a brain bragging Peter that not only will you deny me here, let me give you the timetable for when it's going to happen. So I want to close by talking about the way the Lord views us, which sometimes can seem kind of negative if you don't really read the whole counsel of Scripture. I want you to look at some of the ways that we're described. Jeremiah talks about us just being clay in the hands of the Lord, just wet dirt. That doesn't sound too positive. <laughs> Second Corinthians confirms that. We are jars of earthen clay but we have a treasure in them. Jesus, when he looked at the crowds, he would say, they're distressed, they're scattered. But thanks be to God, we have a good shepherd who lay down his life for us. Well, the picture of temporariness is Old Testament and New Testament. We're withering grass, we're a vapor. But because we have believed that Christ died for us, because we have a Savior, because he lives within us, we've also been buried with him already through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. We have an old nature that is continually being corrupted. When you find a pastor that you love and respect and he taught the word of God so well and then you find out that he's fallen into some sort of immoral sin and it just devastates the church, devastates your heart. I understand that. I have an old nature. It is worse now than whenever I first came to Christ. I am more capable of gross and terrible sin now than I was decades ago if I do not walk by the power of the Spirit of Christ. My old nature is more corrupt now than it ever has been. All the more reason for me to depend on Christ to live through me. And thanks be to God, I have an old nature that's continually being corrupted, but I've been made a new creature where the old things have passed away and new things have come. On and on it goes, both Old and New Testament. If you focus on the way that he realistically sees us, you could be depressed. But take the whole counsel of God that he also sees us 
as we really are because of Christ and what we shall be. You have been crucified with Christ. You are a chosen race. You are part of a royal priesthood. You are a child of God. You are a branch that is connected to the true vine, which is Christ. You are collectively the body of Christ. You individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're an heir of God. You're a fellow heir with Christ. In this life of tears and travail and sin and struggle, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. You are uncondemned. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's already prepared beforehand. Why? So that you can walk in them. I think sweetest of all, you're a friend of Jesus. He calls you that. So as you begin the new year, are you aware of how far short you fell in 2021? I tell you what he doesn't want, certainly doesn't need. He doesn't need your resolution. He doesn't need your recommitments. He doesn't need your promise to try harder. Pull yourself up by your own spiritual bootstraps. If your resolve to obey God last year didn't help you to be faithful, why do you think it's going to do it this year? Stop the spiritual madness. One person has ever lived the Christian life. If you're a believer, that person resides in you. That is your only hope of living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Every day for me to say, talk through me, walk through me, act through me. Help my actions be your actions. Moment by moment, live your life through me. When I fail, and I do, and I will, he'll take me aside, like Peter, and he'll say, Michael, do you love me? Like Peter, I may say yes. In a moment of rare honesty, maybe like Peter, I may even want to change the word a little. Not, not enough, but yes, I love you. If I truly love him, if you truly love him, if I choose to say, Lord, live through me, you are my life. I am in you, you in me. Then he'll reaffirm his will for me and you. For Marty and myself, it might be ten sheep, feed sheep. For you, something else. But he will tell you his will for you after the cart and horse theologically are straight. Do you love me? Then do this. And then based on your love and clear guidance from him, go forth into the new year and let it be what he desires. Now, I'm going to close in prayer, but I want to highlight that for many of you, you may want to come and talk with me about this. Marty's out in the audience. You can come talk with him. His heart is that of a shepherd. He'll, uh, he'll spend time with you if you want to talk about this. But the one to really talk to is the Lord. Reaffirm your love for him. And we have people, you'll see them in the lobby with their prayer lanyards on, their face masks that say, may I pray with you. You should take advantage of them, a brother or sister that wants to pray for you. That's such a vital ministry. I love that ministry. It doesn't always get a lot of, um, I guess, publicity around here. We're going to have a group of folks from this church that are going to take turns uh, here the first week of February and spend the entire night here in this church praying for it. Different hours, different people, and things like that. When's the last time since high school you did something that exciting and fun? To spend all night long with people that you like praying, uh, in this case, here for this church. But I encourage you to take advantage of the prayer warriors out here. I encourage you to take advantage of Marty or me. But why don't we pray together as we enter into a new year. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us. And you're so kind to us. And we do love you. 
And we are so aware of our failings and our shortcomings, but certainly no more so than you. And so we tell you that we love you. We ask you to live your life through us. We give you this new year as we give you our life, and we pray that you, by your power, would live through us, would talk to us, would walk and act through us. Thank you for another year of life. Thank you for your love.